Um, if you're here and um, you're here because and you're just trying to figure out who God is and maybe on a journey of seeking after him, my sense is even as we sang that song, there's something in your heart that's going, I can't quite put my finger on it, but there's something about this. I just want you to pay attention to that feeling. That's, that's God wooing you, drawing you to himself. I'm so glad you're here with us on this Easter weekend. And I also want to say a big welcome to those watching on live stream. We've got friends in Asia who are watching, people in the Middle East who are watching, northern Iraq. Welcome to you as well. Um, and, um, and we're just so excited that our Christ is alive. We, we know the name Jesus, but maybe a name that you're not so familiar with is a guy named Dave Bresnahan. Uh, Bresnahan uh, is pretty well known in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. Uh, he was a second string catcher for the Williamsport Bills. Um, and uh, and it, you know, he, he decided he wanted to liven up the game a little bit one day, August 1987. It's a baseball game, uh, bottom of the fifth, two outs, runner on third, and Bresnahan's behind the plate. He calls time. And the ump gives him time, and he says, hey, I, I, I need to get a new mitt. My, my mitt's kind of breaking down here. And so the ump gives him permission. He goes back to the dugout, gets another mitt, and uh, comes out. And unbeknownst to everyone else in the game, what Bresnahan has done as he gets down in the catcher stance is that in the mitt is a potato that's carved to look like a baseball. He tucks it behind his right leg, gets in the catcher's stance. The pitcher goes to the motion, just hurls a fastball. It cracks his mitt. Bresnahan fires up out of his stance and then chucks this baseball, seemingly, down the third baseline, but throws it high on purpose over the third baseman's head. The runner on third sees this object flying by him, going into left field, and he starts running home. So he's running home, looking back and seeing he's safe. He slows down to a trot, and there is Bresnahan at home plate waiting for him with his mitt, with the real baseball in it, tags him out, rolls the baseball out to the pitcher's mound, and the team leaves and goes back to the dugout. Everyone is confused as to what just happened. The umps are confused, and one of the, the ump on the third baseline, he runs out into the outfield and goes and picks up what he thinks might be a baseball and finds it's a carved up potato. Um, and uh, the umps end up, they eject Bresnahan from the game. The, 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 the team finds him 50 bucks for the stunt. And then the Cleveland Indians, this is a farm team for the Cleveland Indians, they call the next day and they remove Bresnahan from the, uh, from the roster. Has done. His baseball career is over. Uh, the, the Indians aren't too happy with him, but the fans, they love him. In fact, two years later, they have Dave Bresnahan Day. And to get to the ball game, the way to get into the ball game is it'll cost you one dollar and one potato, and you get in. And, uh, and on that day, they retire Bresnahan's number. He's there. He's got a microphone. They're interviewing him. And he says, you know, uh, Lou Gehrig played in 2,130 consecutive baseball games. He batted with a 340 average, and they retired his number. I batted 140 and threw a potato into left field, and my number's being retired. <laughs> he takes a baseball, and he signs it, this spuds for you, and it's in the Hall of Fame. It's kind of a, it's, it's a crazy story, uh, and, um, but for a moment, imagine you're the runner on third base. You're the runner on third base, and this object goes flying by you, and you make an assumption. It's a false assumption, but you make an assumption that, the, the, you know, it, this matches your experience, right? I mean, if, you're, if you play baseball, you've been on base before, you've seen a ball go out in the outfield or it's bounced through the legs of the, of the infielder, and so you, you've, you've had this experience. You've stolen a base, and you've been called safe. This matches your experience. In fact, the crowd is cheering you on as well. They're cheering you on, telling you to run. Your team is telling you to run. And so based on your own experience and based on what the crowd is saying to you, you make the assumption that you're going to be safe at home. And he's out. Now, this is Easter weekend. Can I, can I just say this to us? Jesus had a way of confronting our false assumptions about life. And he did this over and over again. And he would say things like, hey, if you want to be great in this world... Uh, don't climb the ladder, actually descend the ladder and become the servant of all. That's greatness. 
He, he also said, you know, if you have an enemy, don't attack your enemy. Don't retaliate. Actually, love your enemy. People's necks would snap like, what's he talking about? And they said, you know, you can gain the whole world, but then forfeit your soul. Jesus confronts our false assumptions about life. The empty tomb confronts our false assumptions about life. Hey, here's the deal. See, some of you, uh, um, you see, the reality is, see, we're all going to take that trot home one day. Right? We're all going to take that trot home. Hey, we're all going to die. H- Happy Easter. We're, we're all, we're, we, 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 we just don't talk about this. And we all have our assumptions. You know, some assumptions, this is all there is. So just soak it up, enjoy it all. Some are some, there's, there's a lot of ways home. But Jesus confronts our assumptions and he says something pretty dramatic. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. No one gets home except through me. And could I say to you, maybe you're here today and you've made some assumptions about life. And could it be, it's a false assumption. Could it be your assumptions are completely all wrong. And friends, for some day, the day we go home is going to be a day of joy. For others, it's a terrifying day. And maybe your assumptions are all wrong. And maybe you're even right now thinking, you know, well, maybe your assumptions are all wrong. That's a fair question. It really is. It's a fair question. I mean, how do I know that, that, that what I'm assuming is, is to be true? And can I just take my, part of my own journey is investigating Jesus? And you know, you know that there, there's a lot of major religions, major faith religions in, in our world, world religions, and there are faith leaders. And you can visit the tombs that contain the remains of all those spiritual leaders except one, Jesus. You can go to Medina, Saudi Arabia, you can visit the tomb of Muhammad. You can go to Asia and visit Buddha's tomb. But there is no tomb that contains the remains of Jesus. Now that might sound preposterous to you and unbelievable. You're in good company. That, the disciples thought the same thing. What, what, what are you talking about? People don't walk out of tombs. His best friends thought that. But then there were 500 plus witnesses who said they had a personal experience with a resurrected Jesus. 500. I'm, think about this. Give them 15 minutes of their day in court. Give them eight hour days, 15 minutes. It would take nearly 16 days to hear all their testimony. You go into that courtroom day one, you go in as, as a cynic. You go in day two, ah, you're, you're a skeptic. You go in day three, now you're doubting. Day four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. This is pretty compelling. 500 plus witnesses, an empty tomb. And guess what? Even the media of Jesus' day was writing about this event. Not CNN or BBC or Fox News. There were historians, people who were writing down what was happening that was significant in the world. A guy named Tacitus, not a Christian, he writes about the the, the death of Christ. And a guy named Josephus, he's a Jewish historian, he writes this. He says, about this time there lived Jesus. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. And when upon the accusation of the principal men among us, Pilate had condemned him to a cross. Those who had first come to love him did not cease to love him. On the third day, he appeared to them restored to life. The tribe of the Christians, so-called after him, has still to this day not disappeared. That's that's the media of the day. You know, you can shut this whole baby down and just produce a body, right? But there's an empty tomb. 500 plus witnesses, the media of the day already. And guess what? Even today, people are encountering the risen Christ. Dr. Francis Collins, he was an atheist at the time, and he was given the job of mapping DNA. He led the Human Genome Project. He's an atheist, and he's working with other scientists to to study DNA. They're they're mapping the human genome, and along the way, he just says, you know, this all can't be by happenstance. There's no way that this just kind of came together. It's too intricate. It's too detailed. And so Collins begins investigating who God might be. He, He meets the God of the Bible and actually becomes a Christ follower. He writes a book called The Language of God. Listen to what Collins says. This guy once was an atheist. He says, for me, the experience of sequencing the human genome as uncovering uh, and uncovering this most remar- remarkable of all texts was both a stunning scientific achievement and an occasion of worship. The God of the Bible is also the God of the genome. He can be worshipped in the cathedral or in the laboratory. Friends, like Collins, maybe your assumptions about life are false. Jesus has provided a way for you to be safe at home, to enjoy life now, and to enjoy it forever. 
I want you to hear another story. Greg's story. Greg goes to St. Lawrence Church. I want you to hear about his experience as he encounters Christ. Let's watch this. I grew up in Bend, Oregon. Um, in my opinion, one of the best places to grow up as a kid. I had some great friends, um, great community. Um, it was a great time and place to grow up. I also, at the same time, growing up, went to church with my parents. And that was not such a great thing in, in my life at that time because it the church was fairly legalistic. And I, I remember in my Sunday school class, my teacher asking me, why are you here? And I thought, well, if you don't know, <laughs> how am I supposed to know? I remember one particular time, my dad had got us uh, skiing lessons up at Mount Bachelor on Saturdays. And we still go to church on Sunday, but we had ski lessons on Saturday. So uh, this one Saturday, the weather had changed and they had to move it to Sunday. We still went to church on Sunday, but we uh, were going to leave early because we needed to make it up to the skiing lessons. I remember this lady coming out in the in the lobby area and telling me, you're going to hell. And I'm like, what? No, we're going skiing. And then I realized she's serious, like just be for leaving church. So that made it, that's a memory I have that's made a big mark on me when I was a kid. And it just uh, accentuated the fact that that just one little thing wrong and you're, you're out. So I had that view of Jesus early on and it actually confused me. I actually got angry <laughs> because why can't, I believed in Jesus. Uh, why can't, why aren't you approachable? Why can't I get to know you? And so I ended up just walking away from the church, probably about in middle school. I just said, I can't do this. This is not for me. This is, and I was really angry with God. I said some pretty angry things to him. Uh, I started going to church again with my girlfriend, Lisa, who's now my wife. Um, and uh, I just remember one day going to church. I remember exactly where we were sitting. It was four pews from the back. I was the fourth seat in. I don't remember anything about the service. I don't remember what the preacher was saying. I don't remember what songs we sang. I don't remember what verses we said. The only thing I remember is the presence of God. And the presence of God just came upon me and I instantly knew there was a Jesus. And not only that, there was a Jesus that loved me unconditionally and there's nothing I needed to do to get that, nothing. And I knew it immediately. I gave my life to Christ again even though I had given my life to Christ as a kid, um, out of fear, <laughs> this time I gave my life to Christ because I met, I feel like I met the real Jesus. Here's where I've landed with this. I feel like I was given a false Jesus. Um, the Jesus that, you know, as long as I was doing all the right things, that I was good. Um, but as soon as one thing, uh, I did one thing, I was out. So I decided it was easier to walk away and actually it was a relief. Now, after I became a follower of Jesus, I was way different. Um, and here's the biggest thing. I didn't stop experiencing bad things or making bad decisions or things like that. But I had a person I could go to and, and confess. I had a person I could go to that knew, that I knew was in it with me, which is very, gives you a lot of hope, gives you a lot of peace in your life. And it's led me to a lot of good things. Um, and I feel like my trajectory after I met the real Jesus is I want to know more. I want to be more like Jesus. Maybe you're watching this and you can relate to my story. Uh, and, and maybe you even met somebody in church early on that gave you a sense of a false Jesus. Um, that uh, a Jesus is hard to approach. A Jesus that... You have to earn. Um, so I would encourage you to be introduced to the real Jesus, the Jesus that loves you unconditionally, that is in this with you, and that is right beside you, um, and is a place of hope and peace. I, I, I love Greg's story. And can I, can I just say this? Maybe you hear and a false Jesus was presented to you. I'm, I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry that, that sometimes we don't get it right, but we keep pursuing, keep pressing in. And, and, and I want you to hear today the, the good news that Jesus has for you because um, he, he made it possible for you to be reconnected with him. Um, but be, really, to get to the good news, you have to understand the bad news. And, and, and it's this, it's that every one of us has, has blown it. We, we're, we've all made a mess of our lives. And we've, we've all sinned. Isaiah captures this pretty well. He says, we're all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. So here's the deal. It's very easy to say, well, there's so much wrong with our world and see it out there. We, so we know this. And then when it comes to our own personal shortcomings, what we tend to do is compare ourselves to people around us. Say, well, at least I'm not as bad as that person. You know, at least I'm not like her or him. The problem is we're comparing ourselves to the wrong person. When you compare ourselves to the standards that, and, and to God and what he requires of us, man, we, we fall, fall very short. In fact, this is what Paul writes to the church of Rome. He, he, he says this, everyone has sinned and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. That word sin is a word we don't use very often. It means to miss the mark or to, to cross a boundary or cross the line. And we know from our human experience that when someone crosses the line with us, I mean, it breaks the relationship, right? And it, it, you know, we, so there's a distance, there's a separation. That's the exact same thing would happen between us and God. Now, that's a problem. But here's why we celebrate on Easter. We celebrate because God sent his son, and Jesus lived a sinless life. He lived the life that you and I could never have lived. And on top of that, he takes the debt that we owe to God he takes that upon himself when he goes to the cross. And the reason he suffers on the cross is to pay our penalty so that we could be safe at home. In fact, um, Paul continues this in, 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 a church, in a letter to the church in Corinth. He says, for God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. And then Jesus says these powerful words. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Here's the good news, friends. That God cared about you so much that he would send his son to pay the debt that you owed him. Jesus pays that debt for it and then gives you his righteousness so that when you come trotting home that one day, you come home with safe and secure knowing that your hope is in a Christ. Who, who not only lived a sinless life, he walked out of a tomb. And that's the kind of person you want to trust your life to, a person who's conquered death. So here's what we're going to do. See, some of you, you can relate very well to Greg's story. See, you used to go to church, and you're back here today because Grandma bribed you with a ham. She said, you know, you come, and then we'll do it. You know, Mom and Dad said, please come, and you're, so you're here. I'm really glad you're here. Some of you are here because Easter is an important time for you to be in church. I'm really glad you're here. Thank you for, for being here and, and for, for just for trusting us. But can I say to you, maybe you're in that fourth pew from the back that Greg talked about. Can I say to you, here's what God's saying today. Come home. It's time to come home. It's, it's all right. I see the pain. I see the hurt. But I want you to come home. I want things to be right between us. And there's others of you, you've never begun this friendship. You've been seeking, and I want to say, it's time. It's time to receive this grace we've been singing about. Look, you felt it when we were singing. It's time to come home. So the team's going to come join me out here, and here's what I want to ask you to do. As we keep singing and keep celebrating, I'm going to invite you to come up at the cross. There are going to be some people over here. They're going to help you. And, um, and I want you to just, there's a white ribbon up here in the jar, and, and they're going to have, them, and there's pens, and I'm going to invite you to just kind of write your name on a white ribbon, and you're going to pound it on the cross. When you pound it on the cross, here's what you're saying. You're simply saying, yeah, I, I, I know that I've made mistakes, and I, I know that things aren't right between me and God, but today I'm admitting my mistakes, and I'm asking for forgiveness, and I want that relationship restored. That's what you're doing. So let's stand. We're going to sing and celebrate together. And you can start coming now. You can start coming out. Have a conversation over here and impound that white, white ribbon. And we are going to celebrate with you because we were there too once. We know. Look, look, sometimes holy moments require movement. And God's already tugging on your heart. It's beating fast. That's him talking to you. Come, let's worship. 